if you look at the root causes of World War I, it's, uh, it's absolutely insane. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in Sarajevo, and that sets this huge chain of events into play. Two months later, you have millions of men in arms uh, fighting each other in France. Nobody's quite sure why, um, but everybody's very sure that their cause is just and that it's the other person's fault. If you look at it just from a political standpoint, it's, it's, it's madness. Americans were interested in the conflict. Um, they read about it in the newspapers. And for the most part, they wanted to make sure that they stayed out of it. The years leading up to America's involvement in World War I were considered the progressive era. There was tremendous social reform taking place at the time. The United States was really coming into its own as a major industrial and cultural influence in the world. This was a country still on the mend pretty much from the uh, devastation of the Civil War. But as I said, there was so much in terms of um, invention and uh, creativity that was coming out of this country that there became a real sense of nationalist pride. This was the time when the National Park Service was established, you know, so people were beginning to really appreciate the beauty of this country. This was also a time of um, real governmental reform and organizing this country and taking care of its assets. There was a real sense of responsibility stewardship, that type of thing. And I think it carried over into everyday life for um, American citizens and Henrico citizens. Thanks to the spiraling hostilities that raged a world away from the farms and coal mines of Henrico, that sense of duty was to be called upon and tested to an unprecedented degree. Whether fighting overseas, caring for the wounded, or sacrificing through rations and supplying food, clothing, weaponry, and money for the war effort, everyone would soon be affected. The one thing about the United States is when we're not in a war, we tend to be very complacent. We reduce our military, we reduce the army, we re reduce the Navy, but we have all of these munitions plants and factories that can easily be turned over into wartime production. And Great Britain needed armaments, they needed munitions. And Richmond's Tredegar Ironworks was ready to respond. Though the United States did not have a military stake in the conflict, we had our foot in the door by way of commerce. So there was definitely money to be made off of uh, the conflict. And even though Americans wanted to be neutral, you know, as soon as the conflict begins, Wilson issues a proclamation of neutrality. Uh, but at the same time, we were pretty much aiding Britain and France uh, to the detriment of Germany. And Germany is going to get wise to this and basically get sick of it uh, in 1917, which is going to uh, lead to unrestricted submarine warfare, which is going to lead uh, to America's involvement. So slowly, uh, President Wilson was diverting his attention overseas to Europe, and I think it was a matter of time before the U.S. was going to get pulled into the conflict. Even though the United States didn't have a military interest, we had somewhat of a moral obligation to participate in the war. The event that most consolidated that moral obligation was the sinking of the British ocean liner, the Lusitania, on May 7, 1915, which took more than a thousand lives. She went down off the coast of Ireland, taking with her civilian passengers, as well as munitions bound for England whole headline splash sinking of the Lusitania. It was sunk by a German U-boat and there were a number of American lives that were lost. And this started to draw Americans into the fight. They started thinking, well, if the Germans could sink our ocean liners, what else can they do? The government spared no expense in the further shaping of public opinion, both to convince citizens that war was necessary and to instill the notion that it was everyone's duty to participate. The First World War, not only for the Americans, but also for our allies, was a very visual war. Photographs and motion pictures well documented what was going on overseas, but also on the home front. 
And on top of this, you have these beautifully illustrated posters that not only encourage young men to enlist in the military or young women to enlist in the either the Red Cross or the Nurse Corps, but also posters reminding American citizens that they had to sacrifice, that we had to have these meatless days, we had to have these wheatless days. We had to develop our own sort of farming system. Each person had to contribute in his or her own way for the war effort. And then you had this whole elaborate um, fundraising mechanism with the Liberty Loans in order to raise money. So you had these beautiful posters and you had now stage and screen stars that would come out and rally American citizens to give money to help build up for the war effort. Americans were watching and listening to what was going on over there and so I think for many Americans when Woodrow Wilson declared war they were ready. They believed that this was a just cause and people like Shepard Crump were ready to go and do their duty. Shepard Crump of Meadow Farm in Henrico was an officer in the newly formed National Guard. His unit, the 29th Division, was part of the largest and fastest military mobilization the world had ever seen. When President Wilson declared war in April 1917, we were totally unprepared for the war. We had a very small regular army, a small navy, um, a fairly sizable Marine Corps that had actually experience in fighting overseas, but it was going to be the army that would do the brunt of the fighting. The average foot soldier in World War I is somebody who was most likely conscripted or drafted into the Federal Service, so they, they're coming in with virtually no military experience whatsoever. <laughs> And as they entered the war, they now had to be trained. So training camps were set up for what were known as the National Guard units, the regular Army units, and the draftees, which were called the National Army units. And they had specific camps, and instructors who had some experience in the military came in and taught them the rudiments of being a soldier and how to fire a gun how to march, how to take commands. Camp Lee in Prince George County was one of those massive installations that rose like magic in order to quickly turn ordinary citizens into soldiers. Some, like Shepard Crump, had already spent time in local militias such as the Richmond Light Infantry Blues, but the vast majority were the result of an unpopular conscription, like the 484 men processed through the Henrico Draft Board. So Crump's a little bit different. He, he comes from a little bit more well-to-do family. Uh, he has a little bit more experience uh, as far as military matters are concerned. Uh, by the time the war breaks out, uh, in 1916, he's promoted to first lieutenant, so he's an officer. Officers get paid more and they have nicer uniforms. And, uh, so he, he's sort of, uh, you know, the upper crust, uh, if you will, of um, farmers in Henrico at the time. When the Army started to form, there was a lot of pressure from our allies, Great Britain and France, for example, who said, look, just send your soldiers over and we'll put them in the lines, we'll amalgamate them. Essentially, we'll put them in with our experienced troops. By 1917, both the British and the French had been decimated. Major campaigns such as the Somme, which took place in July 1916, you, know, you had um, roughly 30,000 British troops killed in one day. While that was going on concurrently, you had an attack in Verdun, which was on the other side of the Western Front, where French soldiers had been slaughtered um, in the battlefields there. 
Plus there had been heavy fighting in Belgium, an area called Passchendaele. So by the time the United States entered the war, the British and the French were really eager, you could see, even say desperate for more troops. And here you had these strapping young American men that they felt would fit in nicely. Well, President Wilson said no. The Americans are gonna fight as an independent force. And Wilson was largely thinking along the lines of when the war would eventually end, he wanted to have a good say at the peace table. After several months when the American troops were finally learning how to be a soldier and the pressure was mounting to get more and more American forces, the Germans, even though they were in the same devastating situation as the British and French, they recognized that if they were gonna have any chance of winning this war, they had to defeat the Allies, again, the British and French, before the Americans came over in full force. Because once that was gonna occur, the Americans would be the dominant force overseas. And so the Germans started building up for a great offensive. This occurred in the spring of 1918, which meant the Americans needed to get over there as fast as possible. However, there was one major issue. We did not have the transportation to get American troops from our ports on the East Coast to England and or France. So, waves of freshly minted American forces sailed for France aboard British cargo vessels and captured German ocean liners, which had been converted into troop transports. They were escorted by Navy destroyers through sea lanes that were menaced by German submarines. Shepard Crump wrote his girlfriend, Elizabeth Adam, about one such close call. July 19th, somewhere at sea. Last Tuesday, there was a sub scare just about sunset and three of our boats got into action. We fired 20 shots. We couldn't see the object as it was several miles away, but could plainly see the column of water where the shells hit. And the object, whatever it was, disappeared and was not seen again. Eventually, the Americans would land either in ports in England, such as Liverpool, or would go all the way to France and um, land in Calais or other ports where they would disembark and um, these camps were set up for them before assignments of where they were gonna go while they were overseas. The Germans knew the Americans were there and they would um, entertain them by sending airplanes over and flying low, try, just trying to make noise and to scare the Americans to tell them, hey, you're in a war zone now. And this was a war zone like no other. Millions had died by the time the American doughboys arrived. The clash of modern technology and antiquated tactics was producing horrific results. Airplanes, tanks, machine guns, long distance artillery, and poison gas were wreaking havoc and would force the continual adaptation of strategy on both sides. And one of the things that especially the American army was faced up, is we were still in this frontier mentality, which meant the cavalry, the use of horses. Well, the British had used this as well early in the war, and they discovered horses on the Western Front as a tactical weapon were not working. They were too vulnerable to artillery and to machine gun fire. So what happened is cavalry units started to become uh, abolished and the Americans had to face this similar kind of thing. We kept, I believe, um, two regiments of cavalry, which were sort of kept in the rear, but horses also were very important in bringing supplies from the rear to the front, whether it was the sanitary trains, which brought medical supplies to field hospitals, or ammunition trains, which were reminiscent of the Civil War, where you were bringing large artillery pieces and also artillery shells up to the front. Which had been locked in a stalemate since late 1914. The Russian Empire had already pulled out of the war, freeing up two million German soldiers for service on the Western Front, the line of defenses that stretched from the North Sea to the Swiss border. These were the Kaiser's most experienced warriors, and Virginia boys were there to meet them when they arrived. The 29th Division as a whole sees a lot of service in World War I. The Richmond Line Infantry Blues were activated uh, in the Federal Service and they went through several sort of mutations. They were the 1st Virginia Cavalry, 
and then when they were activated to go as part of the American Expeditionary Force, they're turned into the 104th Ammunition Train of the 29th Division. And divisions in World War I were these monstrous, unwieldy uh, formations of 28,000 men. Uh, they were huge, and they were designed to, to be able to stay and man a sector uh, in France, in the trenches, for a prolonged period of time, the assumption being that they're going to take casualties. Uh, so you can have 28,000 men out there uh, and they can take a lot of casualties and still be able to get the job done. So the 104th Ammunition Trade is sort of a cog in this huge machine of the 29th Division. And they're literally that, they're a train. Crump's unit was actually horse-drawn. Uh, so they're bringing up artillery ammunition to the field artillery and rifle ammunition to machine gun ammunition to the infantry. So that, that was their task. They uh, arrived in France a little bit later than the rest of the 29th, so the 29th sort of went off uh, as a whole, and they're gonna see uh, some severe fighting in the Meuse-Argonne campaign. 3,000 miles from home, an American army is fighting for you. Everything you hold worthwhile is at stake. Only the hardest blows can win against the enemy we are fighting. The Mers argonne campaign is the largest battle ever fought uh, by the United States Army, even to this day. And it's the first large-scale deployment uh, of the AEF. Their, their objective is a railway junction that is going to, um, if they take it, it's going to cut off the supplies to the German Army, and the German Army is going to be in serious trouble. It's just a huge, huge undertaking. The ammunition required for such an endeavor would now come from our own backyard, where a mobilization of a different sort was taking shape. Henrico County would play a brief but prominent role in supporting the cause with a massive gunpowder bagging plant that was built on a site made famous during the Civil War. More than two decades before Rosie the Riveter became an icon of the World War II era, the Women's Munition Reserve at Seven Pines was carving out new roles for those left behind. We needed Americans to come forward and help with the war effort. Keep in mind, we had roughly four million men in service. And there were also women who served as well as nurses and other medical support, also as telephone operators, which were called Hello Girls. But also women were forced to come to service and the civilian capacity working in munitions factories. Their sons and husbands were over there serving and so they felt it was their duty to promote the war effort in whatever way that they could. The bag loading plant that was built at Seven Pines was one that was going to be staffed by women primarily. There was a drive, there were posters printed and there was a drive to recruit women to come and work at the munitions plant. So they certainly felt a sense of duty, you know, they can't be on the, the front line, they, they're not serving, and it certainly was never a thought to that during that time period, but they did have a strong sense that this was their fight as well. For guns and shells alone won't let them blast the German lines unless we send them powder charges made of seven pines. It would take more than just the hell behind the shell, as it was known at Seven Pines. The boys needed to get their boots on the ground before any significant gains could be made. It immediately became clear how untrained the American soldiers were. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, if you will, rookie mistakes that were made. But the Americans learned very, very quickly. They learned on the job. And you had small units that were pretty much decimating the German forces. German soldiers were surrendering in droves to the Americans because we were learning how to fight. And we were learning the tactics of this very technically advanced war. They were fighting differently uh, than the way that the British and the French fought. Uh, the British and the French had been fighting on the Western Front, at least, in trenches, uh, where you have sort of these massive uh, infantry assaults on earthworks that uh, just result in catastrophic losses. Pershing did not want to fight like that. He wanted to fight using what they called open warfare. He didn't want to be in the trenches. He wanted to be out in the woods maneuvering uh, more sort of in the, in the line of the way that the armies fought during the Civil War. A young officer like Lieutenant Crump had heard about fighting in the Civil War 
and the heroics of battlefields around Richmond. He wanted to get into the action and prove his mettle. He was an officer. He was in charge of other young men. And the idea of going to the front, the heroism, certainly must have uh, been throughout his, his mind. And he also recognized that this war wasn't going to last forever. I think in a month at the latest, we should be on our way to the front. And when we get there, goodbye, Kaiser Bill. The Americans were coming over there. There had been this great stalemate, and he was eager to get to the front. And certainly, the British and the French wanted him at the front, but it was a slow process from going from the rear areas to the actual battle lines. And lo and behold, this great pandemic, though, comes in and takes over. It was the Spanish influenza, which was ravaging Europe on a scale not seen since the Great Plague of the 14th century. And the training camps were not immune. In fact, they were the perfect breeding ground for the virus. There is still a lot of influenza here, but the situation is improving. There have been seven deaths in the battalion, but only two were Richmond boys. They were members of my old cavalry troop. The home front was suffering as well. It was horrible. Uh, it was absolutely horrible. They shut down the entire city. The city was pretty much on lockdown. You, you couldn't leave your house. Uh, school was canceled. Church was canceled. Every activity that you could do that would sort of tie you in with the rest of society and sort of keep you sane, keep your mind off the war, going to church, going to school, just going about your daily life has been taken away from you. The pandemic also robbed Shepard Crump of the chance to prove himself on the battlefield. Perhaps to his detriment or maybe to his luck, uh, Lieutenant Crump, the influenza epidemic hits and his unit is pulled back before they have the opportunity to go forward. And he is kept behind in a quarantine situation. Crump could only follow his unit's adventures in the war's final throes by word of mouth and through newspapers. And the news was good, unless you were itching for a fight but stuck in a holding pattern. The German army was in retreat, and talk of a peace deal was in the air by the fall of 1918. From the news that has just come, it looks as if we might go home sooner than expected. But if it closes before I get to the front and get in action, I will certainly be sore and disappointed. Just think of it, over two years in the service and get left out of the biggest show the world has ever seen. Isn't it enough to make a man sick? From the letters, I think we feel a certain sense of frustration from Shepard Crump that he's not where the action is. And then when the quarantine comes along, that's just further delaying what he hopes will, will be his inevitable ability to fight on the front. Meanwhile, Crump, like other soldiers, wrote letters, lots of letters. The troops hungered for news from home, anything that reminded them of their former lives that war had interrupted. During the First World War, soldiers were heavily encouraged to write home. In fact, the Red Cross and other civic organizations would hand out papers and pencil to soldiers to write home and to make sure that their loved ones knew what was going on overseas. But take that as just vice versa, Soldiers wanted to hear about what was going on in the country, so they encouraged their families, their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, their girlfriends, their wives, or friends to write to them. So now we have this rich source of first-hand accounts, letters written of how America was coping during the First World War. You know, letters talking about the farming communities, about the crops, but also talking about the decimation of small towns and our cities from the influenza epidemic. And, and these things you can't discount of, of how important they are and how they help tell the story of the United States' role during the First World War in 1917 and 1918. Dear Shepard, I'm sending you the pictures I promised you. Both of the mules are fat. The little calf is just two days old and is very wobbly, all head and legs. We couldn't get all the chickens in the picture. The cow is Lily, and she has kept us in milk and butter ever since last July. Your devoted mother. Shepard Crump had a farm to run, 
but he also had war training that he desperately wanted to put to use. Our brigade has already started to move and we are scheduled to leave in a few days, so I'm hoping and praying that I get there before it all ends. The quarantine doesn't lift until uh, late October of 1918, and the 104th Ammunition Train is charged with going uh, to the front, uh, and they, they board the train on November 11th, which is the day that the armistice was signed. So they got there just in time uh, to see this, the end of the war, <laughs> and they, they didn't see any fighting. I'll be honest with you, I'll tell you the truth. I arrived after the fighting was all over. Certainly was disappointed though, as I'd like to have seen some of it. He had enlisted in 1903 in the Light Infantry Blues, and so this was, you know, you don't want to say a dream of his, but he really, it was important that when this came along, this was the opportunity that he'd been waiting for. So certainly he felt um, uh, a sense of disappointment. This was just somebody who was a soldier at heart. That same sense of duty and devotion was shared at bag loading plant number three. And the armistice was met with an equally bittersweet reaction, especially when word came of the looming shutdown. It was officially open for less than a month when the fighting stopped on the 11th hour of the 11th day in the 11th month of 1918, idling the more than 1,300 women of the WMR. Tears and sorrow would overcome me now, were it not that I have won the everlasting privilege of being able to look back. That is the joy of the whole thing. In those later days, soon to come, we, as well as our brave boys, can point with unblemished pride to the part we played in the World War. Winifred Crenshaw, President of the WMR. Shepard Crump ultimately made his military mark beyond the battlefield when he was chosen to represent the 104th ammunition train at the Paris caucus in 1919, during which the American Legion was created. The organization was created with the well-being of returning veterans in mind, many of whom were at a loss for words about what they'd witnessed and endured overseas. It's a largely forgotten war, and it goes back to the fact that uh, our ancestors who fought during that time period, whether it's a grandfather, a great uncle, or even a father, they didn't talk a lot about the war. As time went on, it became clear that what we had proclaimed we were fighting for did not happen when you looked at the Treaty of Versailles. And Wilson promised a war to make the world safe for democracy, and you had the colonial powers just carving up the world after the fact. And basically blaming Germany for everything. And that led to, the, to World War II in many ways, what, what came out of that. So I think there was a disillusionment of that, even early on in the 1920s, that people, they recognized that. Not that they could predict World War II was coming, but what they had done while they were very honorable in doing their duty and, and serving their country, the, the aims did not match the reality. I think on a national scale, at least for the Americans, they kind of wanted to put this behind them. We wanted to grow as a country, and we certainly did grow as a result of the war. America moved on, and we prospered. And before we started to recognize about the First World War and our family members who fought there, lo and behold, the Second World War eclipses the First World War. And we start to think about that, and the First World War is largely forgotten. Shepard Crump never forgot. He was instrumental in bringing an American Legion post to Glen Allen and was its first commander. He also married Elizabeth Adam, whose letters had kept him company while on deployment. By 1955, Crump had risen to the rank of Adjutant General of the Virginia National Guard. His dedication to public service and the place he called home continues to live on today. It was at his request that Elizabeth Adam Crump donated Meadow Farm to Henrico County in 1975, thus preserving and sharing this remarkable property for generations to come. <laughs>